So again, we've been given what seems like quite a daunting task. We've been given this photo of this large coastal landscape, and you know, somewhere along the lines of what processes are, have led to the formation of this landscape or altered this landscape. Maybe you've been asked to talk about how the geology of the landscape has affected uh, its kind of changes over time. But again, it comes down to identifying the landform that is uh, evident in this photo. In this case, the clearest uh, photos were the headland and bays. So straight away, we then again need to get into exactly how those headland and bays have formed, and that is going to allow us to answer the question. Again, like we've talked about in other uh, sort of physical geography, landform formation, we're going to go through this PEST idea. So remember, the P stands for the processes involved in it. The explanation is the E. So actually that how does it form how do those processes lead to the change in the landscape that we've seen the s the sequencing fundamentally important to make sure we have that correct sequencing that step-by-step -step process and the t the terminology and the time scale on which we're talking that last one particularly the time scale when we're talking about headlands and bays is pretty simple it's going to be a really long time period we're looking at hundreds thousands of years for a coastline as we saw in that photo to have developed into such a significant bay and headland system. So, process then. Headlands and bays, most importantly, are a landform of erosion. As soon as we start thinking about landform erosion, then we need to start thinking about the processes, the terminology that we're going to be using. Okay. Hydraulic action is obviously going to be one of them but also processes such as abrasion are worthwhile considering. Headlands and bays form a something that we call a discordant coastline. Really key terminology in here, thinking back to that T. Okay. What we mean by discordant coastline is that the bands of rock, the bedrock geology, uh, is at 90 degrees to the sea. So what we've got is a band here in the pink of less resistant rock. For example, on our Dorset case study, uh, Swanage Bay is a perfect example of this. Uh, you've got some quite soft clays sitting underneath Swanage where the town is built. And the two headlands uh, either side of uh, Swanage are made of a more resistant uh, geology, uh, in this case a chalk or a limestone. And here they're shown by the, the black dashes. So we've got this discordant coastline with bands of more and less resistant rock at 90 degrees to the coast. That is fundamentally important. That is the first stage that we need to explain in our, uh, form, our explanation of how a head and a base system is formed. So we can put number one up there, just so that we know that's the first stage. What we then got to work out is how a straight coastline like that, with those bands of different rock, leads to that kind of uneven coastline that I showed you in the photo a minute ago. And actually it is relatively simple. The less resistant rock is going to be more vulnerable to the uh, power of the sea, and it's going to be more quickly eroded by processes such as hydraulic action and abrasion. The less resistant rock therefore will erode backwards to form a bay, whereas the more resistant rock will be uh, able to withstand the force of the sea more, and therefore will be less sticking out to sea to form a headland. So we might end up with... It's only looking a bit like that, okay, where we still have our less resistant rock here, and then our more resistant rock. Less sticking out to sea like that. In the exam, write it something along the lines of this. The less of the system rock is eroded more rapidly by the processes of erosion, such as hydraulic action and abrasion. Remember, I'm explaining it, but I'm also trying to get that terminology in, and I've named the processes, creating a bay, whereas the more resistant rock is left jutting out to sea as headlands. A common mistake that many students make in the exam is to assume that their job is done at this point. Um, but actually, the sequence of head and bay formation does carry on for a little bit. And uh, you know, we want to make sure we're achieving those four marks. So we want to consider what happens after this has developed. What we need to consider is actually what now happens to the wave energy in this uh, landscape. As the waves approach the shoreline, they will be approaching normally uh, kind of parallel to the coastline with the wave front in a straight line like we've got here. However, as the waves start to approach the shore, they will start to have increased friction and contact with the seabed. 
as the sea gets shallower. This increased friction is also going to slow down the waves. Now, the issue that we have is on a straight coastline, like we had at the very, very start, this would not cause a problem. The waves would be coming in, and they, the whole part of the wave would be experiencing exactly the same amount of friction, so therefore it would slow down at the same rate. However, that isn't the case now that we have this kind of more uh, uneven coastline. The headlands obviously stick further out to sea, so the areas of the wave closest to the headlands experience shallower water earlier on, and therefore more friction. This friction therefore slows down the parts of the waves uh, near the headlands. As they begin to slow down due to the friction, they actually uh, force to curve in towards the headland. Okay, we call this process of the waves starting to curve towards the coastline here as wave refraction. In terms of trying to give you a real life example of that, something to kind of grasp, if you've ever kind of been in a car when it's gone through a, a large puddle near the side of the road, you may feel that the side of the car nearest to the curb kind of slows down more as it goes through the puddle it slows it down and the car will kind of maneuver itself or kind of uh, suddenly veer slightly towards the curb if and needs to be corrected and the same idea is happening toward with the waves the area closest to the headland this part of the wave is experiencing more friction shallower water and is therefore slowing down whereas this part of the wave in the bay is still in deeper water and is therefore still trying to carry out a higher speed, forcing the wave to turn in towards the headland. And this means the majority of the wave's energy is concentrated on the sides of the headland. As a result, we start to see increased levels of erosion on the headland sides, and that may then lead to the development of landforms such as caves, arches, stacks and stumps that we'll look at in a later video. Because the wave energy is concentrated here on the side of the headlands, wave energy actually in the bay is very, very low. The water is relatively shallow, the headlands shelter it from any high winds, and as we said, the wave refraction focuses most of the energy on the headland sides. As a result, low wave energy, normally constructive waves, results in high levels of deposition in the bay, and things like beaches begin to form.